May 11th is the anniversary of President James Polk requesting a declaration of war by the United States against Mexico in 1846. He got it two days later. The United States won the war. On the whole, that's a good thing. But it does illustrate a very tricky problem with respect to self-government when it comes to foreign policy, defense, and national security. Now, I say on the whole I'm in favor of the outcome of the Mexican-American War because the United States gained an enormous amount of territory in that conflict, and the United States, I think, has been an enormous force for good in the world. That doesn't justify taking territory from any neighbor if it happens to look good to you. But the truth is that Mexico wasn't just unfit to govern Texas. The Mexican government was by and large unfit to govern Mexico. It's revealing that in 1846, the year the war began, Mexico's presidency changed hands four times, its defense ministry six times, its finance ministry 16 times. It essentially had no control over Texas. Apache raids had left thousands dead, and the Mexican government was powerless to prevent it. It was an unstable dictatorship. There is almost nothing good to say about the governance of Mexico. And of course, the war has its origins in Texas achieving independence in 1836, fighting against a Mexican dictator who didn't even have the support of his own people, who didn't respect the Mexican constitution. Now, on the other side, you have to concede, yes, Mexico had abolished slavery, at least on paper. And the settlers from the United States into Texas, by and large, were slave owners. When Texas joined the United States, it did it as a slave state. It was part of the Confederacy. So that's on Mexico's side. But by and large, the outcome of the war doesn't trouble me. I think the world is an enormously better place for the fact that the United States became a truly continental power with its victory in 1848. But here's the problem. After Texas achieved its independence in 1836, and a lot of Texans wanted to join the United States, a lot of Americans wanted Texas to join, mostly Southerners because of the slave issue. A lot of Northerners didn't. But if Texas didn't join the United States, what was it going to do? Was it going to be reconquered by Mexico? Was it going to join Britain? It actually might have done that. So there was a strategic problem both for the Texans and the Americans. And in 1844, as this problem became increasingly acute, President John Tyler had signed a treaty of annexation with Texas. Now, the president can't just annex places. Obviously, it had to go to the Congress. But while the treaty was being considered, Tyler promised that he would protect Texas from foreign invasion, meaning, among other things, if the Mexicans invaded, to try and stop Texas from joining the United States because they were still sore about what had happened in 1836. And so here's the problem you see for people who believe in self-government, who believe in legislative control of the executive, who admire the American system in which it is the Congress, not the executive, that has the power to declare war, for people who would like to see Canada's parliament have a much larger say in the conduct of foreign affairs and to get to vote on key missions. It is so easy for the executive, as Tyler had done, to put the country's prestige on the line in such a way that the legislature really has no choice. Now, it's worth noting here that American public opinion was increasingly in favor of annexing Texas, despite Northern reservations. The presidential election of 1844 was fought on the annexation issue, and it was won by Polk largely because he was in favor of it, unlike his Whig opponent. The American people were increasingly in favor of it, especially because there was essentially open warfare with Mexico anyway, and the national pride was stung. Public opinion is ultimately decisive. And it's also important to understand that it's legislatures that vote appropriations. So in some sense, a legislature can refuse to fund a war even if the executive has declared one. But to do so is to make yourself seem not only unpatriotic, but frankly hostile to your own country. So you've got to keep an eye on the executive early on. The legislature and the citizens, the lesson here is, must be alert to what is happening and not to place too much trust in formal arrangements that say in the end it is the Senate or the Congress that must declare war. Because it's so easy for the chief executive, particularly in foreign affairs, to use their discretion in such a way that the legislature, and even to some significant degree the populace, have no choice. So yes, keep an eye on what those in power are doing, because they could well be up to things that will leave you no practical choice when matters come to a head. That was certainly the case when Polk asked for that declaration of war in 1846. He and his predecessor had already committed the United States to war, and there was nothing the Congress could do, no matter what it wanted to do, except say yes and go to war.
even if the war is a justified war, even if the outcome of the war is good, you really do not want the executive wielding that kind of power without popular and legislative scrutiny. So pay attention early and often, because by the time they ask for a declaration of war, it's almost certainly too late. If you're enjoying these commentaries, please visit my website, that's johnrobson.ca, and make a contribution to help me continue in my work. And keep watching The Rebel, keep subscribing to The Rebel for the news and commentary you won't get anywhere else.